you know, from from Elvis to Hendrix to so many uh, hundreds of others, Bob, some of my favorite musicians have struggled with addiction, have died from it. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more? What 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 do you think? Why do musicians, I mean, and other artists and certainly people, but musicians specifically, why do you think they struggle or are vulnerable so much around addiction? I can still remember uh, my first year in high school as a sophomore in biology class with Mr. Pittman and the speaker, the loudspeaker in the classroom coming on, and Mr. Peterson, the principal, saying, Ladies and gentlemen, Jimi Hendrix just passed away. Never will mm. forget that. It was, mm. uh, just, uh, I was in a band as a boy. My brother was a guitarist, and we played Hendrix. Uh, uh, we played that. We'd learned that stuff off the radio. Played at dances. Can you people used to dance to that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was I was way way into him when he passed away, yeah. and then a few weeks later, Janis Joplin, and so on. It goes. Right. You know, soon enough, later on in the decade, Keith Moon and John Bonham, all these all these avatars for yeah. you and me as drummers and as musicians. Yeah. Uh, I'm a deep, deep lover of jazz and have been for decades and so much lost. Right. Charlie Parker, John yes. Holt, I mean, just, just go down the list yeah. of all the giants. And really, ultimately, Miles Davis. I mean, these are people that really, really struggle with uh, addiction. There's there's no single answer to this, but I thought about it a lot. I'll tell you one in into it. Um, it was after I finished graduate school. I finished graduate school about 35 years ago. Well, there's a lot that's happened in the last 30 years. And right after I finished graduate school, there was a woman at a local research institute up in Santa Barbara who began studying what has now become a whole literature in psychology of highly sensitive person, a highly yes. sensitive person in literature, yeah. Elaine Aaron. She literally did her research after I graduated from high school, yes. from a graduate school. And I've read her material and viewed it and pondered this a lot because I've worked a lot with musicians. I'll tell you this. When I ask in a room full of, let's say, 20, I work primarily with young men, and many of them are musicians. If I ask a group of 20 men, if I define just a few characteristics of being what Elaine Aaron says is a highly sensitive person, her research has been done cross-culturally across the world. It turns out that 20% of individuals are what they merit this. Uh, it's, a, it's not a pathological diagnosis. It's just a temperamental thing. If you're highly sensitive, it means that you notice things that people don't notice. You, you feel things differently. You certainly are attuned to aesthetics in terms of beauty, et cetera. There's a whole list of characteristics. And so 20% of people, and it's equally distributed with men and women. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a chick thing. It's men and women <laughs> equally distributed. Yes. And, and I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'll discuss, discuss it about as much as we just did. And I'll say, how many of you would say this fits for you? And there'll be 80% of the, the people I see in, a, in, in the rooms that I work with. And I work with a lot of groups. It's not a scientific study, but it's a, it's a growing sample. And, and then if I get into it, more deeply and talk about those that are connected to art and music it's virtually 100 percent right. and you and i both know exceptions to that there are plenty of drummers that are here and they're not particularly sensitive people that's right. cool. that's fine right. i am one of those and i don't know you david but i imagine that you are by virtue yeah. of the fact that you're <laughs> as a therapist as right. well as uh, as a musician that cares about these matters right. and so i think there's a i think there's a disproportionate representation of high sensitivity among artistic types this is not a scientific thing it's more of an intuitive hunch and kind of yeah. clinically grounded and so with with the fact that there'll be musicians there'll be musicians that are just kind of lunks i think a good number of them are highly sensitive and you've seen interviews with jimmy yeah. uh, or with elvis or we just go down the list and you see these people they're extremely oftentimes introverted yes. they spent years and years woodshedding developing their acts right. they're thrust onto stage in front of people adoring fans prince comes to mind i mean just right. massive adulation yes. and uh their giftedness is obvious, but they're not, they're really kind of like Brian Wilson. He wasn't made for these times. He just wasn't, it made us, what the hell do you do with that? And so I think a lot of them implode into self-medication. I could be wrong about that, but my sense is they implode in self-medication as a way to manage the, uh, the outer. Uh, uh, there's another piece though that happens, and, and I'd love to talk into this with you, is that I, I've worked with a lot of musicians, and you have too, I would imagine, that if they ponder stopping whatever it is that they use, alcohol, uh, 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 marijuana, any substance, they'll tell me, Bob, I've never composed a song without being altered. Right. I, you know, I've never once performed on stage without being messed up. I mean, that is 
common yeah. and they're scared to death and understandably so. And for a lot of them, they just say, there's no way I'm going to, the sobriety thing is going to be the end of my career. I'm done. Right. I forget it. I'm not going to do it. Sure. And so uh, we can talk more about the implications of that, but I think that, you know, I've had so many of them, t- uh, musicians tell me, and I think, no, I do want to say a word about that. I think it's also tied into the creative process, David, and you can reflect on your own experience. Uh, I imagine you're a creative person. I figure that I am. I mean, creativity kind of flows through me. But if I get into a creative funk or a block or if I get depressed or if I'm, on pres- if I'm pressured on a timeline, to move into the mental space that creativity requires, it's not fully a left brain thing, as you and I both know. And if I can alter it with substance, it, it's possible it'll crack open a door into kind of non-ordinary thinking, which might be seen as kind of a facsimile of creativity. The downside to that, and we talk more about this, I don't, I don't feel moralistic about this, I feel scientific about it, is that if addiction knocks out the front part of my brain pretty thoroughly where you know addiction is primarily a midbrain phenomenon is that most of what i need in terms of creative juices is a forebrain phenomenon if you knock out my creative faculties it's not that i won't i you know i can get out of my head i get out of my head i can get messed up right now and get out of my head the problem is that I've gotten out of my head, and part of being a creative drummer or a musician, a composer for me, requires having my head intact. And so it's a strange mix there. And I think that's so. It's a, I don't know if I'm articulating it well, but I think there's a certain portion of musicians that, in order to create, have to alter consciousness, and it becomes attached to substances. And I do think that creativity is an altered state of consciousness. Is there a way to alter my state of consciousness without wiping out my forebrain, which is required for creativity? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, a, a lot of sense. In some in some places, they call it state dependent learning. You yes. sort of we, we learn under that yeah. state, and yeah. then we become yeah. dependent on it. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, I've heard a lot of musicians and a lot of even actors uh, and artists talk about that. If I give yes. up the substance, I won't yeah. be as good. But that's yeah. that's yeah. the myth, I think. And yeah. some people I th- say. I think you're making a very good point, and and my thought about it, I can speak about this personally, is that drumming over the years got more and more associated for me with alcohol. I just, I was altered, and there's a fine line, and you know this is a drum because it requires so much coordination. Yes. You can't can't get too messed up and still have access to to coordinated independence, let's say. Having said that, I certainly flirted with that edge and went over it any number of times. I had to decouple uh, drumming from being altered chemically for me. Right. And there's a period of time that reminds me, I'm not much of a, of a golfer, but I understand that Tiger Woods at some point had to completely redo his golf swing from yeah. the ground because he wanted to take it to the next level. It's like that. If I want to take it to the next level, I'm going to probably have to decouple this state dependent learning from being messed up on uh, uh, drugs or other, you know, alcohol or whatever. And it's a way of kind of building it up from the beginning. I don't think you start from scratch, but I think I can guarantee you it felt odd to me right. to be playing and not be chemically altered. It doesn't anymore. It's, and, and I, I have, I have no doubt I'm 64. I'm Paul McCartney's uh, yeah. from the stage right now. <laughs> 64. I have no doubt that I'm, I'm the best drummer I've ever been right now in my life, which is incredible. That's awesome. time limited because I'm getting older, but right. it's just, I feel like I've got all cylinders firing and that was not possible for uh, that. I'm really grateful for very right. selfish and, and also a bit prideful. I want to be a damn good drummer. Sure. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah.